This is poem number 55. It's part of the mining series. This one covers the Hague Pit explosion on, the Sept on September 5th, 1922. The first part is about the history of the mine. Hague Pit, White Evans' last coal mine, from its beginning was out of line. Starting its life as Wellington Pit, its name was shamed and so did not fit. On the 5th of May 1910, Wellington Pit lost 136 men. The owners then were worried by its name, to which White Evan Fork attached the blame. A change was needed, but what to? General Haig's a winner, that will do. Get rid of the stigma in its name. A brand new start, no more shame. I started here in 1964. It puzzled me fresh in the door. Number five shaft, winding call. Number four, man riding, that was all. Something missing, what could it be? What happened to shafts, one to three? Down on the dock, not at work. Under crenellated walls designed by a smirk. But way back then the fire derailed, westward development it curtailed. Where to go and what to do, southwards to Sortum and past is new. High above Sortum pit, new shafts were sunk under it. Sortum's old workings full of water, with extensive workings in the six quarters. Hague, 1,200 feet beneath the wave, driven westwards, time would save, from Wellington Pit on the West Strand, the shafts would join in the main band. Driven westwards on the level, the drifts intercepted the coal seams as they dipped. Passing through, the first seams met. The six quarters seam was the better bet. This productive seam at six feet or more tall would provide the new pit with some coal. Half a mile from the shafts to the west, two working districts were the best. Further west, the little main seam had been worked by another team. At two feet three, three men had to crawl, so it was given up for the thicker coal. At 350 yards from the bottom of the pit, through a fault, the seam was hit. At eight foot thick, the six quarter seam fitted the bill the miners dream. A smaller district to the southwest in the same seam was being progressed. The, the number five drift to the west had hauled into the Wellington drift in the six quarters call. Number two, the explosion. On the 5th of September 1922, miners underground there were 82, working to the north in the six quarter seam. 38 miners were set about in teams. Two man, work, two man se teams worked each heading our board. They got, filled and hauled and trailed tubs to the haulage road. In headings to the deep compressed air haulage was used, the screaming of its engines with dust and darkness fused. Deputy reports for the 12 month state, fire damp was found in various gates. On the morning of the explosion, 82 miners descended. 39 of them did not return when the shift had ended. A few minutes before nine, the banksman at number four shaft saw a cloud of dust rising up against the draft. He immediately informed the colliery agent, Mr. Steele, by telephone at William Pitt about what he had seen. Mr. Steele and Mr. Brawley, the William Pitt manager, telephoned the rescue station to alert them to the danger. They informed Mr. Cook, His Majesty's Mines Inspector, who lived close by in Whitehaven, covering this sector. The pit engineer, Mr. Parker, went into the mine with Mr. Rothery, storekeeper at the time. Being alerted to the danger, they had already gone down. Mr. Steele and Mr. Brawley met them underground. 
The ventilation fan on the surface had stopped. During the explosion, the trip switch, trip switch had dropped. Mr. Seal sent the engineer to the electric station to make arrangements to restart the ventilation. Mr. Miller, the under-manager of the mine, was at the compressor house. Everything was fine. With Travaskis, the rope splicer, who we'd chanced to meet, both were caught by the explosion and blown off their feet. Mr. Miller was uninjured, but not so Travaskis. He suffered broken ribs and had to go to the surface. Miller went in by after clearing his head, found a boy called Telford lying on the ground dead. Entering one north district, Mr. Miller found the first air crossing violently blown down. Continuing on, the deadly after damp in the air affected him badly, he being totally unaware. Messrs. Steele, Brodie and Thompson, a deputy, proceeded into the Six Quarters District immediately. They reached the air crossing and hear, hearing Miller call, found him lying partly conscious on the ground by the wall. Carrying to the junction he was badly shaken. For medical help, help to the service he was taken. Several stayed to give help in any way they could. Found a ewer called Carter alive by some tubs. Badly injured, he was taken to the surface quickly, but sadly he died on his way to the infirmary. Mr. Cook had by now had reached the Six Quarters Team Junction, consulting Mr. Steele about getting the airflow to function. The air in the return was found to be so foul, full of after damp, nothing could live in it at all. A rescue team ar ar uh, arrived with breathing apparatus. They were sent into the district to report on its status. Returning, the team said as far as they'd gone, large falls of roof prevented them going further on. They needed to get men in to clear up the falls. The air crossing needed the rebuilding of its walls. Mr. Steele and Mr. Brody started to feel the effect of the gas. Overcome by after damp, they were sent to the surface. An under-manager arrived from the drift from Wellington Pit, travelled through to report all was well with it. By early afternoon, the crossings were repaired. Drifts to Wellington were sealed to give the pit more air. Ventilation restored, the air took its normal course. The after damp was cleared from the pit by force. It was Sunday before the last bodies were recovered the falls of roof making them difficult to discover. After careful examination, the inspector made and interviews with witnesses, witnesses it can be declared. That the seat of the, seat of the explosion was in Moore's place. A strong feeder of fire damp had issued from the face. A shot had just been fired as a matter of course, and that had been the origin of the ignition source. The inspector re recommended that from now in this mine, no explosives were to be used in coal at any time. Naturally, wet throughout was to be investigated, with combustibility of coal dust and the way it was treated. And so 39 men's names pass into history, the first loss of life this mine would ever see. Not the last by any means, for down the ages scrolls, the names of many heroes lost. God bless their souls. In here, Peter Kells, 125 men lost their lives. Most of them with families, their children and their wives. A close-knit community, many of whom despite their sorrow. In the words of an old screen lass, what go back tomorrow. Thank you.